the, the slideshow will accompany my talks, not necessary, but I'm a visual learner, and then, you know, in my head there's outlines and bullet points, and so I thought, you know, if I have a list of things, I'll put it up there, but so if you can't see it, or if you're more of an audio person, it's totally fine. Uh, it is not dependent on uh, my presentation. So if we're going to learn a, about prayer, let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, uh, we give you praise and thanksgiving for bringing us together today. We give you thanks for this Sunday in which your Son rose from the dead to give us life, to give us hope, uh, and to bring us closer to you. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be on our, on our minds and on our hearts as we come to know about prayer, which we converse and grow closer to you. I ask that you bless all of us today, that at whatever stage of life we are in with our prayer, that it may increase, uh, and that we may grow ever closer to you as we take step by step on this journey. We ask this as we ask all things through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So this is going to be a totally comprehensive presentation on prayer. No, just kidding. There's, there's, there's so much I wanted to put. This, oh my gosh, that'd be like four hours long. We'd, we'd scratch the surface. So uh, to this is just to give a foundation, I think, right, for those of you who maybe it's, you're new to praying or to the, to the Catholic way of praying. Um, most of this came from the catechism. So if you want to get more in-depth things or in-depth explanations, you can go to the catechism for that. So prayer... <laughs> So prayer is a conversation with God. It is, um, it is both like and unlike our human relationships. So language and the analogies I'll use, we'll consider is you're like talking to a friend, but then at the same time, this is God. He is otherworldly, he's intangible. How can we communicate with him? God himself has given us ways to communicate. So um, my analogies, will I'll use kind of human relationships, but then they, they can be applied to our relationship with the divine. One of the most important things I think I could tell you is that when you pray, God hears you. No matter how good the prayer is, no matter how confident you are in your own abilities, He hears you. Think of, you need to get a hold of somebody really desperately and you're calling their cell phone. It rings and rings and rings. With each successive ring, there's less hope they're going to answer, right? You're like, oh no, I'm wandering closer to the voicemail. I really needed to get a hold of them. And so our hope diminishes as the, the, it keeps ringing. That is not what prayer is like for God. We are not knocking on the door of heaven thinking, I hope he answers. When we pray, we are responding to God already. He calls us to pray. So to use a phone analogy, it's someone saying like, oh, Sister Shauna, so-and-so is on the phone and handing you the phone. God is on the line for you. He has already called you. We're picking up the phone. He is there. Regardless of how we pray or how much we prayed in the past, God hears that prayer. Because as he says in John's Gospel, it is not you who chose me, it is I who chose you. So no matter what your emotional state is when you sit down to pray or are at Mass or for your rosary or read Scripture, all prayer is good prayer. God does not have a, a sliding rule up in heaven like, hmm, that was really good prayer, Courtney. Like, okay, like that, that'll count for a lot. He doesn't do that. He is happy to be conversing with us. Prayer, um, St. John Damascene said this. He's an early church father. Um, this has been repeated by a lot of the saints. Prayer is a simple, simple lifting up of the heart and the mind to God. We lift up our minds to God, our intellect, our reasoning, even our imagination, giving him control of those, offering them back to him, and lifting up of our heart, our emotions, our feeling, and especially our love, that we're lifting up all of those to God when we pray. There are types of prayer, according to the Catechism, blessing and adoration, petition, intercession, thanksgiving, and praise. Um, and so we can go, we'll go through this one briefly to break it down. Um, I think at the end, Vicky, a lot of time for a discussion or question and answer, which I absolutely love. That's my favorite way to teach. What are you curious about? What are your hangups? What can be clarified? But I think as we go through, if you have quick questions, um, feel free to raise your hand and we can stop there and I can um, engage those. So the first type. Blessing and adoration. Uh, blessing is God's gift. It's God's giving and our acceptance of a gift. It's when they're intertwined and joined together. Uh, blessing, the Latin word for blessing is benedicere. So bene, meaning good, like the word beneficial, and dicere, meaning to speak, like the word to dictate. 
So when we bless God, we say good things about him. We describe him, and in saying that he is good, we're acknowledging that he has been good to us. Uh, in adoration, we are exalting and recognizing the greatness of God who made us. Um, it is just lifting up our own praises to God, acknowledging who he is and what he's done for us, and that he is great. In, in, some, in some ways, unknowable, but that doesn't that our love is not contingent on us knowing who God is fully. That's impossible. But even knowing a little bit of his greatness, we can exalt him and praise him for that greatness. We have petition. To petition someone means to ask, to beseech, to plead, invoke, entreat, cry out. When we when we pray and petition, we recognize our own needs and our dependence on God for everything. That if we need something from somebody, we are dependent on them for that thing. Think about your parents. Uh, when you're an infant, or a child or an infant, you're, you're wholly dependent on your caregivers, on your parents to take care of you. In that same way, we owe our existence and our lives to God. That if God were to stop thinking of us for one moment, we would disappear. God is continually thinking of us. We are that dependent on God. When we pray and petition on a regular basis, we recognize what we really need. We might ask God for something for a long time, and he might not grant it, and even maybe that circumstance, that situation has, has passed. We can come to realize, hmm, okay, God, maybe, maybe I didn't really need this. Or maybe there's something more specific and fruitful I could have prayed for. Like, God, thank you for showing me that. St. Augustine explains uh, to one of his disciples in a letter why God doesn't answer our prayers and petition immediately or completely. I think if he did, we'd become tyrants, right? If, if, we, if we received everything we ever asked for in prayer, we'd get very proud. But God, in his wisdom, again, in his will, he waits sometimes for us when we keep praying. That's because we could pray for this one thing, but this is what God wants to give us. Our hearts are too narrow to receive what he really wants to give us. He says, God, we see God, I need this much. And he says, well, I'm going to give you this much. This is what you really need from me. And so when we pray constantly for things that we need, our desire grows. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. So I encourage you when you're praying for something, pray without getting weary. Pray without ceasing. Uh, a couple days ago in Mass, we had the story of a woman who goes to an unjust judge who fears neither God nor respects humanity, and she bothers him all the time, like, render a just verdict for this case. You know, I deserve this. And our Lord says, this unjust judge, he does. It's like, fine, because she's annoying me, I will grant her this. Christ is saying, even if this unjust person listened because of the tenacity of this woman's prayers, how much so does God hear our prayers? He who is good, he who is a source of goodness, how much more does he answer our prayers when we are persistent? So instead of giving us what we want right away, sometimes, sometimes he might wait. And so it's up to us to trust him that God will give us what we need when we need it, that it's on God's time. Uh, another part of petition is asking for forgiveness. Another thing we need, that God, I messed up. I ask that you please forgive me. I am sorry for what I've done and what I've, when I've sinned against you, I ask for your forgiveness. Now, we do this at the beginning of every Mass in what is called the penitential rite. We show penitence. We show sorrow for our sins. In that way, we prepare ourselves for Mass. I think of kind of, we're getting the cobwebs out of our heart or of our soul. We're, we're, getting, we're getting our souls ready for Mass. Right? We're kind of bringing all the, all the baggage, baggage and garbage we brought with us. Like, Lord, take it. You know, Lord, I've sinned like, through my fault. Um, I ask for your prayers and ask for the prayers of all the angels and saints. That even in the beginning of Mass, one of the first things we do is we ask God for his mercy. In receiving from God with prayers of petition, we also get the humility to receive from him what he wants to give us. You know, like I said, we could be praying for one thing, but really the best thing that God wants to give us is right over here. So there's a humility, especially if we don't get what we wanted. Instead of stamping our feet and being like, God, you're unfair, I didn't get what I wanted. Well, God knows a little bit better than what we do. And so some, when he gives that, we have the humility to say, oh, God, you know what, you are right. Thank you for granting this part of my prayer, or things turned out a little differently, but I accept that. So that's part of praying with humility and praying in petition and asking God for things. Intercession. To ask on behalf of another person. 
We can ask God for things that we need. And in intercession, we ask for what other people need. And so here, our concern grows for what other people in our community need, that we are the whole body of Christ. It doesn't include, it's more than who's in this room, or at this parish, or in the diocese, or in the U.S. The church consists of every person. The body of Christ consists of every Christian in the entire world, and those people we're trying to draw into ourselves. It consists of the holy souls in purgatory who are being purified, and it consists of the church triumphant, those angels and saints in heaven that when we pray for other people's needs, we can become aware of perhaps what's going on in other parts of our country or other parts of the world, that we don't just exist as an isolated entity, but all of us are bound together as brothers and sisters in Christ. The saints are doing this in heaven right now for us. We just had All Saints Day, that if they're saints, we can almost guarantee they were praying for other people while they were still alive on earth. Right? We're talking about St. Elizabeth of Hungary. She had concern for people who needed things. That I know that as she provided for their physical well-being and their needs, she was also praying for their, that their spiritual needs may be met. So in heaven, in heaven, the saints still have the ability to pray, but they don't need anything. So what do you pray for? They pray for us. They still have that ability to pray. And the one analogy I once heard is, Asking somebody for something in person, it's more meaningful. That when you got married, you probably sat someone down, will you be my best man? Will you be my maid of honor? You know, when your children are getting baptized, will you be the godparent? That there are some things we want to show respect and dignity. It's more important than a text or a phone call or a letter or voicemail. We do it in person. Like, you know what? I'll ask that person to do that for you. Let me ask in person. It's more meaningful. Now that the saints are face to face with God, that's what they're doing. They can ask those big favors for us. So this we have in common with the saints, that they don't pray and petition anymore because they are lacking nothing, being in heaven. But since they can still pray, they're praying for us. Uh, Interaction time. So raise your hand if you think you know what is the most powerful prayer of the church. Who wants to guess? Vicky, what do you think? The it's the Mass. So, Hail Mary, excellent. Our Father, beautiful. The Rosary, uh, incredible. But the most powerful prayer we have is the Mass. The priest, before he says Mass, when I'm getting vested in the sacristy, we have a sheet of names of those who have died. And that's the ma- Each Mass, we have an intention in which we pray for that person who's died. Uh, people can, they pay a small stipend to the front office, and then uh, they're communicated to the priest. So just at Mass, as you hear, I think it's the last intercession, you know, for our Book of Remembrance, for this prayers in our hearts, and for blank, for whom this Mass is being offered. That's the Mass intention. Every single Mass that a priest prays, he has an intention. That the grace and the great merits from this beautiful prayer, this amazing, powerful prayer of the Church, would be applied to a soul in purgatory, right? Who can't pray for themselves, who needs our prayers. All of you are capable of bringing an intention to Mass. When, I, when I'm at NCC, uh, where I'm chaplain, uh, it's a way I could get the high schoolers uh, involved in the Mass. They might think it's boring, or uh, it, it's just a typical Wednesday, or I go on Sundays, it's just a typical thing. So I tell them, what is bothering you the most today? Or what's been on your heart? Is it a difficult relationship, maybe at home? Um, did you just break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend? Is a class not going well? Is something in the world has happened, is that bothering you? I tell them, bring that to Mass. When you come in and sit down, you can say, God, I'm offering my prayers, the prayers of the Mass for this. I think it keeps them engaged. Because that's what I have to do when I'm overwhelmed with uh, people who have asked me to pray for things or just what's happening in the world. I just say, God, I'm going to offer Mass for this. It's the most powerful prayer, I think the most effective prayer. Um, so it's something we are all capable of, not just the priests. So when you come into Mass, you get settled, you get focused. Before Mass starts, you can think, okay, you know, I'm going to offer this for the souls in purgatory or somebody in my life or somebody's about to receive a sacrament, like confirmation, marriage, or holy order. Like, God, I'm going to pray this Mass for them. That's also a part of intercession. Thanksgiving. That's Thursday, right? Thanksgiving is a style of prayer. The word Eucharist itself means to give thanks. Um, and I... I wanted to recall the first, chap- or the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. He says, in all circumstances, give thanks. 
So again, this is a part of receiving a gift well is we complete the loop by saying thank you. Imagine you're a child, you get a gift at, at Christmas, and your parent goes, okay, what do you tell grandma? Thank you. Or, or, or go over there and say thank you. Thank you. Or as you get older, you know, we write a card, a thank you card. Especially, you know, you receive gifts at ordination or for your wedding. Those take a lot of time. It's a lot of people. But to receive a gift well from God, we also give thanks to him for it. Right? We complete that loop. To uh, receive a gift well, we give one back by saying thank you. In all circumstances, give thanks. This is Bishop Efforts, Episcopal, uh, his bishop's motto. That when he became a bishop, he got to choose a phrase. Uh, bishop Foy's was, let your light shine. Luceat Lux Vestra. Bishop Efforts is, at all circumstances, in all things, give thanks. And at his consecration, when he became a bishop two years ago, um, I was one of the deacons for the Mass. So I was still in seminary, but I was a deacon. And I sat in the chair as far as we are. Right? He was in his cathedra, his bishop's chair. I was in the sanctuary in another chair. And as the ceremony had kind of come to its end, he had been consecrated. Um, it was time for the final blessing. He sat and he explained why he chose this motto. He said, Thanksgiving is the proper Christian response in everything. Okay, that's easy. Things are good. Thank you, God. But what about like when you get stuck in traffic and you're rushing? Are, are we quick to say, thank you, God? Probably not. I need to work a lot on that one. But in all things to give thanks. If you remember the story of Job in the Old Testament, he's being tested by God, everything is taken from him. And one thing that Job says to his friends is he said, we thank God for what is good. Should we not accept the bad? That all things work together for God's good. This does take a lot of maturity in spirituality and in prayer, but sometimes you get stuck in traffic. God, thank you for the opportunity to exercise patience. Right? It might not feel good in the moment, but God is giving us a chance to do that. Or that difficult person shows up in your life again. God, thank you for giving me a chance to love like your son did or to love when it's difficult. That in reality, every circumstance, we can give thanks. Um, I think of, you know, maybe a loved one dies. God, thank you for the opportunity to take advantage of my time here with my other loved ones or to tell them how much I love them. That in everything, we can give thanks. The most important way we do that is within the Mass. We thank Him for what He's done for us. We thank Him for the church of old, which has brought us here. Um, we give Him thanks for everything. I know in the Mass, as it would have been known in the first couple centuries of the church, for the offertory procession when the bread and wine are brought up, uh, farmers and craftsmen, they would have brought their things up that they made and the, they harvested, their first fruits, to give thanks. God, here's my harvest this year. The church gets the first 10%, right, before I, I dive into it. So that was a part of the liturgy is that we, you brought what you were thankful for, what you had been blessed with. In that, we recognize that all blessings come from God. They're not because of our own, our own merits or gifts, but that God has chosen to bless us with those things. Of course. So. <clears throat> I think that's, that's always very apparent to me um, when celebrating sacraments within the Mass. Like we had uh, those four children came in, they did um, you know, RCIC with you. Is, how joyful was that you know, when they received communion for the first time? I'm sure they were thanking God you know, for calling them and allowing them to respond, to say yes, to enter the church, be baptized. Or I think of you know, weddings within the context of Mass. Like what, there's no better way to thank God for what has just happened than to do it in the context of the Eucharist and of Mass. Like, wow, like I'm, I'm, sure I'm sure the couples are full of thanksgiving and just they, can't keep, they just can't stop giving gratitude. Well, then what a better way is to give that back to God within the Mass. Okay. There we go. Praise. In this, we acknowledge God not only for what he does for us, but that he is. How, how profound is that? It's like a form of thanksgiving. Praise is just thanking God. God, you are. Thank you. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for 
bringing the whole universe into existence. Thank you for sustaining it. God, you just are. So we don't have to know any fancy theological things about God or, or who He is. And I'm sure there's people, when people are first called to pray, even without knowing really who He is, they can acknowledge that He is. Uh, in the first letter of the Corinthians, Paul tells us that we have one God, the Father from whom all things are and for all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things are and through whom we exist. I think we always have a reason to pray in praise because, you know, when you wake up, thank you, God. Um, or as is told to me in, in seminary, we have a choice when we wake up. It's either, um, good morning, God, or we say, good God, it's morning. <laughs> so again, we have the choice. We have the choice um, to do one of those. So, uh, sometimes I do both. So now we have expressions of prayer. What does it look like? How do they manifest themselves in our lives? Um, the Catechism speaks of three major ones, vocal prayer, meditation, and contemplation. So uh, vocal prayer, a very apparent one, is during Mass. The Lord be with you, everyone says, with and with your spirit. spirit. Right? We pray together. I think that binds us together. Or if you ever prayed a rosary with other people. Um, I, I once heard from a priest, as he said, when we pray a rosary with other people, it is as if we are praying that many rosaries. Mm. So, you know, I love playing the rosary with other people because I think, oh, like, what's my intention for this rosary? Or maybe for each decade, I think of somebody else. It's like we're praying that many Hail Marys at once. Vocal prayer, again, is praying out loud or it's praying with other people. Um, and I have... A, I don't have an activity. I'll have a description of how, how do you pray with other people. It's very simple. Um, it'd be very powerful if someone says, hey, you know, Lane, can you pray for me? Like, sure. And then you can say, do you want to do it right now? That, that I had to learn to do, but man, is that powerful. Like you're in the grocery store, you're in the parking lot, uh, you see somebody in public or after mass, it's like, let's, let's pray right now. Because sometimes they're in tears, like, oh, my loved one has to have surgery or I have to have a procedure and I'm really nervous or my... You know, my, my son is trying to get clean. He's in rehab. It's like, let's pray right now. You're just praying out loud is so powerful. Because uh, again, it can be, it's different to hear God's voice, but easy to hear the voice of another person. Mm -hmm. So when we can pray out loud, it means a lot to the other person. Meditation. So I think this can be done even, you know, with secular self-help books to meditate to center oneself, to calm oneself down, to take time to focus on what is important. Um, this is meditation. It can be a reflection on a thought or a scripture passage. Um, sometimes it's engaging the imagination, like in uh, Lexio Divina, in which you, know, you, you pray, you read very slowly a piece of scripture three times, each time reflecting what's sticking out to you, um, what, is, what sounds important to you, or what is, what's piquing your interest in this. Um, with engaging the, the imagination, I think it's St. Ignatius again who mentioned when you read a gospel passage, like put yourself in there. Like we can use our imaginations. It's not just you know, for, for kids who are playing house or playing kitchen, but we can engage that and it's so fruitful in prayer. One thing you, you can imagine, like are you like a narrator? Are you just watching this scene? You know, Christ is healing somebody. Is it just unfolding? Are you one of the disciples? Are you there? Is Christ talking to you? You know, what does he look like? Is it hot? Is it cold outside? Or are your feet sandy or dirty? Um, or you can imagine, you know, you're the person being healed. What does that look like? How does that feel? That, I think that's a really good way to help with distractions in prayer, is to just immerse yourself in it. Um, I know for, for the, the readings in Mass, you know, the first reading, the second reading, the Gospel, um, reading it beforehand, I think, can be really fruitful. Because then when you hear it in Mass, you know it's being said, and you can immerse yourself in it. Um, also, read, uh, looking at the Sunday readings before Mass can be helpful if you have children. That when it gets to the homily and you think, I have no idea what was said until now. Um, <laughs> if you've reflected and looked at even at least the Gospel, you'll have a good idea of what the priest is going to talk about. Uh, the next one, contemplation. I think this is a logical pro progression from meditation. Meditation is very active. We're centering, there's a phrase, we're thinking, we're processing, we're, we're, we're pushing out other thoughts. Contemplation is 
passive. Passive and not being inactive, but passive and receiving. That when we're centered, when we're calm, and when God is speaking to us, that is contemplation. We, we do very little. We just receive. I think in here we're going to talk about silence in prayer. How um, I think it's, it's necessary, it's critical. Is it always possible? Sometimes no. But I think there's a difference between internal and external silence. So just like it's good to pray with other people, I think it's good to pray by yourself or pray when you're alone. Or the church, during the day it's open, it's empty. You just go in there and pray. Because Christ himself would go up a mountain by himself to pray. He is God. He is in perfect communion with his Father. But through his humanity, he teaches us what to do. Another reason why we pray. Well, if Jesus did it, we should do it, right? You know, we should uh, reach out our hand to the poor. We should bear our cross well. We should preach the good news to all the nations. Christ was baptized. We should be baptized. So if Christ prays, then we should pray. He has no need to, but he shows us that in the busyness, in the midst of his ministry, he would go up, usually at night or very early in the morning, uh, he would go up a mountain to pray by himself. Then I always love it, he's either the disciples go and find him or he comes back down and the disciples say, where were you? Um, a good reminder that uh, it is important to take time for prayer, even though there are people who depend on us, there will be things we could always do, but prayer time is always so necessary and, fr and so fruitful. There is a, prayer is a battle. What keeps us from praying? Uh, no, these things can be erroneous conceptions of prayer, what we think prayer might be, uh, distractions in prayer, there's dryness, a lack of trust or a lack of faith in God or in what we're doing is correct, and then laziness. With erroneous conceptions of prayer, this can be an interesting topic because it might prevent us from praying. Oh, well, I'm not in a church, I can't pray. Or, oh, it's, it's too late in the day, I didn't, I didn't pray earlier, I can't pray now. Or I'm with certain people, I can't pray. Or I'm doing something, I'm doing dishes or I'm washing laundry or I'm changing my baby's diaper, I can't pray. We can pray all the time. St. Paul asks us to pray without ceasing. Uh, there's another church father um, whose name escapes me, but he writes to his followers and to the church, he says, when you're doing anything, you can pray. Absolutely anything. The most mundane things you can pray. Uh, one prayer you can do is like, God, thank me for the ability to do this. You're washing dishes. Lord, thank me for these hands with which you blessed me so I can do your work. Um, you're picking up your kids from school. God, thank you for my children. Thank you that they are safe. That there's so many reasons to give thanks and to pray that we can find one in, in every moment to do so. It's not just for church, not just for when we go to bed, or not just for when we're reading scripture or praying the rosary, we can pray whenever. All prayer is good prayer. Distractions. This was hard because I'm never distracted when I pray. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's all the time. People, uh, they'll tell me, you know, Father, I get distracted praying the rosary, or I'm distracted during Mass. I tell them, good. It means you're human. And with a distraction, we have a choice to make. We can turn that into a gift that we give to God. The gift of turning back to Him. I imagine, you know, prayer, you know, I'm walking with Christ, we're on some wooded path, and I decide, oh, look over there. He keeps going, and I'm way over here, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh man, Christ is over there on the right path. What are the options? Woe is me, I'm bad, I got distracted, he's way over there, there's no point in doing this, I'm done. Or the other option is, God, whoops, sorry, I'll be right there. And we can gently come back to God. That a distraction can benefit us because then we have, we have something we can give back to God, our attention. So no matter how many times you're distracted in prayer or in mass, a gentle coming back. God is pleased with that. We have, we've redirected our attention to him. We've used our will to focus on him again. So be gentle to yourselves too. As, no matter how many times you get distracted, 
can always come back. God, I'm back. God, I'm here again. Thank you. And then you go leave again. Okay, God, I'm, I'm back again. Right? Over, exactly, yeah, over and over again. I heard a monk speak about when he sits down to pray is to be aware of the distractions. Name them. Lord, I have all these things going on. This is bothering me. The world is bothering me. You know, my knee is stiff. Uh, it's going to snow tonight. My kids haven't finished their homework. Start with that and just dig it up and give it to God. God, here. You take care of this while I spend a couple of minutes in prayer. Uh, St. John the 23rd, uh, Pope St. John the 23rd, he's famous for having said to God before he goes to bed, God, I'm going to bed. This is your church. Take care of it. Good night. Because I'm sure you have to have a lot of concerns as Pope, but he would need his rest. So I was like, Lord, in these hours that I am asleep before I can wake up, it's your church. You take care of it. And that's how he would pray. This monk I mentioned, he also said, if you're beginning to pray, just begin with what your emotional state is. God, I'm angry. God, I'm sad. This wasn't a good day. We don't have to make ourselves any way to pray. Right? It's not like putting on a uniform. Oh, I need to be presentable to God before I pray and then I'll hear my prayers. Wherever we are, we can start there. Lord, I don't know how prayer works. Lord, I'm pr praying in this new way. This is awkward and weird. Start there. Like in the, one of the first slides, our relationship with God in prayer can be like a human relationship. Talk to him. He wants to hear it. He knows, what, he knows what's in our hearts, but we grow and we, we become so much better when we make it known to God. You know, imagine God is a father, so imagine your child. How's your day at school? They might say the, the weirdest or craziest things, or you might know how their day at school went, but you still want to hear from your child, don't you? That's what God is like. He wants to hear how your day was or how things are going or, or what you're afraid of or what your goals are. So our emotions, they can enrich our prayer. They don't have to distract us from it. There's a lack of faith and trust. Does God hear me? Am I praying right? Is my prayer doing anything? I think these are all doubts. And doubt only serves to I think, undermine our uh, dedication and our, um, our dedicatedness to pray. Right? Am I doing it right? Well, God knows what is in our heart before we say it. He knows us more than we know ourselves. He loves us more than we love ourselves. So if the words aren't right or it doesn't feel, if prayer doesn't feel that natural or that good, that's okay. God does hear you. There's one of the Psalms that says, can he who made the eye not see? Right? God gave us the eyes. So it, would it, make, it made sense that he could see everything, right? Can he who made the ear not hear? Of course he can. God gave us and designed the human body with two ears. So we can be assured that God can hear if he gave us the ability to do so. So remember, God hears your prayers. No matter how good or bad or how efficacious you think they are, God hears that. Laziness. I'm guilty of this one. Where it's at the end of the day and it's like, I'm going to bed. Like, oh, I got to do, I got to do my prayers. It's right at the end of the day. So one of the, the best ways to pray is on a regular basis, right? That in the morning, you know, you got a good night's sleep. You got a bad night's sleep. Commit yourself to praying that morning offering. Like, God, I'm going to give you all of my, my works and my love and my prayers this day. Or thank God before you get out of bed. You know, good God, it's morning. Like, oh, whoops, that's the wrong one. Like, you know, good morning. Good, good morning, God. <laughs> or at the end of the day, you know, uh, you might say prayers with your, uh, with your child or do your own reflection to do it every night. Especially to examine your conscience. Like, what did the day hold? What is the good I did? What is the evil I committed? And to do that each day um, can be very freeing. And so you're ready for your next, when you go to confession next, because you've been thinking about it. You've been uh, taking note of what habits that you've been doing. Like, oh, Lord, I've been falling into this sin. You know, when I go to confession, I'll make sure to mention that to Father. But sometimes you, you won't feel like praying. I think those are the most important times to pray, because it's to form a good habit. What you do today, you will do tomorrow. 
So the best way to start a habit is to do it every day and to uh, dedicate yourself to doing it day in and day out, whether you feel like it or not. Um, I know accountability can help to pray with your spouse or with a friend or you know, have someone text you, hey, did you pray a rosary today? Hey, did you pray uh, before you went to bed last night? Just like if you're trying to go to the gym every day at, at, at some ungodly hour like 5 a.m., if you go with someone else, there's accountability involved so that you can help each other pray by checking in with each other. And hopefully that will combat the laziness. I think that concludes most of the stuff that was in the catechism, not most of the stuff, some of the stuff that I covered in the catechism, but there are just some uh, bigger things I want to talk about when it comes to prayer as, like, this is the preeminent prayer, the Our Father. Christ's disciples, you know, they're watching John the Baptist, and John the Baptist has his own disciples helping prepare the way for Christ. And Jesus' disciples ask him, Lord, John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. How should we pray? It feels like cheating, right? Like you're asking the person we are praying to, how should we pray? So if you're ever stuck, what do I pray with? How do I do it? Start with the Our Father. It's so full that if we spent a lifetime praying to Our Father and ruminating over it, we would not get to the bottom. It's such a beautiful prayer. I, in seminary, I had a spiritual director whom I saw every two weeks for confession and just for spiritual guidance. And one penance he gave me all the time, which I hated for a long time, was say one Our Father, say it very slowly, and focus on every word. Oh, Father, I got things to do. I can't sit in there. Our Father. Oh, who's out there? Again, my distractions would kick in. But sure enough, he gave it to me enough that it started to click. That I think about each line. What does it mean? Our Father. We are, we are God's children who art in heaven. God, that's, that's where I'm trying to get. That's where I'm aiming. Hallowed be thy name. God, you're, you're, you're so holy just saying your name has power. That with each line of the Our Father, could, you could spend an hour just praying with that. So, good place to start. Yay. The Liturgy of the Hours. Um, Sister Shauna and I are very familiar with these. The Liturgy of the Hours is the prayer of the church. It's the official prayer of the church. It is a daily prayer. It marks the hours of each day and sanctifying the day with prayer. Now, the Liturgy of the Hours, it's not praying for an hour. It's just called that because it marks the hours of the day. Uh, it is an extension of the Mass. The just the Mass starts and ends, go in peace. This is an extension of that time in prayer. It is a four-week praying of all 150 psalms. Anybody can do it. Those who have taken vows, solemn vows in religious orders, those in holy orders, we are obligated to say it under, under penalty of sin. That when I became a deacon, I promised to pray this for the church. Uh, there are five canonical hours um, that usually involve one, sometimes up to three psalms, and end in a scriptural proclamation. Uh, we say the Our Father in it. There's a canticle in which we read um, in the morning, uh, the words of the Magnificat, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Or no, it's in the evening, in the morning, the Benedictus, in which uh, Zechariah praises God. They include intercessions, the Our Father, and a short prayer. Now, there are varying lengths. Most important, morning prayer and evening prayer. Those are the hinges on which our day uh, rests, morning prayer and evening prayer. Uh, they each have uh, themes to them. So morning prayer is about resurrection, new life. It is morning. Lord, bless this day. Evening prayer, there's imagery it uses, you know, Lord, as the sun sets, we can think about, you know, at, one, at some point it'll be the, toward the end of our lives. You know, Lord, you know, I've done good today. I've done evil. You know, please bless what I've done. Um, and of course, night prayer is, is very beautiful. It talks about death a lot. You know, it is dark. We're going to sleep which is like a practice for death in which we let go. At the end of the day, we think about our lives, or that day, just like in the end of our earthly lives, we'll think about what we had done. Yep. Energy of the hours. Um, so th there's five of these a day, um, and this, this helps. 
It helps because it's mandatory. We, we have to do it. But again, it's that commitment that helps combat laziness uh, and dryness and routine. That when I first started praying the Liturgy of the Hours, it was, you know, we get to seminary, you pray a couple hours in common together. But of course, you're called to pray them all. So slowly but surely, I'd add another hour. Okay, every day I'm praying morning, evening prayer, and daytime prayer. Now my brain is so accustomed to it, it will tell me, and it'll make me stop what I'm doing and think, oh, I need to do evening prayer. That in the beginning, again, before I made the vow to do so, I, I would miss hours. I'd be really busy in the evening or, or I'd wake up late, you know, uh, at my parents' house and I'd forget morning prayer. But now it's just a part of my day that I don't look at a couple events ahead without thinking, okay, when can I pray that? So I prayed officer readings and morning prayer uh, when I did my, uh, when I prayed this morning, I did my holy hour uh, in, the, in the convent chapel. So I still have to pray daytime prayer and then, you know, I'll probably pray evening prayer after 40 hours. So my whole day is planned out around praying these. Um, so another good way to just instill prayer in your lives is by habit and by routine. This doesn't have a bullet point, but one thing I learned that was really helpful. So in seminary, priests were encouraged to do a holy hour. So I used that before. It's 60 minutes, you're in the chapel, right? Christ says to his apostles who are falling asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, could you not spend an hour with me? So every single day without, cease, without failure, I pray for an hour. It's in the chapel, read some scripture, I pray, I, plan a hom I pray about a homily. Let's say you're trying a holy hour. If it takes you 55 minutes to get calm and to get rid of distractions and the noises have ceased and, or, or your child is quiet and you only get like five minutes of good prayer, do you think God only counts as five minutes? No. He counts it all. You may feel that you've only made good prayer for those last five minutes or even it's taking you 59 minutes and 30 seconds to calm yourself. And now you're just receiving God's love and then your alarm goes off. God counts all that time you are trying to focus. All prayer is good prayer. Whether it feels good or not. Because God appreciates so much that you're trying. That if it's dry, if it's just, you're begrudgingly doing this, nothing is working, nothing feels good. That is still prayer. Like, like, to struggle well, again, is to uh, give a gift to God. So remember that whenever you're praying, like when we're praying today or you're trying the rosary or reading the scripture and you feel it's not working, God still really, really appreciates that you're trying. He appreciates those 55 minutes it took you to pray. Learning to pray, it is a skill, right? And just like it involves like playing an instrument or learning a sport involves our minds and bodies or perhaps learning a language, it's a skill. That the more time you spend in learning about it and trying it out and trying different styles of prayer to see what fits you, the more time you take for that, uh, the better off you will be in your prayer life. But also when it's like starting one of these things, the first step in being good at something is being bad at it. So again, be charitable to yourself, right? This, yeah, um, you know, Jimi Hendrix at one point was a bad guitar player. Or Fulton Sheen at one point didn't like public speaking. Take any professional or any person we hold in very, very high regard or like a, a leader. They were bad at doing that at one point. Maybe they were young. Maybe they overcame that fear when they were older. That's the first step in trying anything new is to try it for the first time and if you're really bad at it, okay. Next time, you'll be a little better. But of course, with learning a routine or a new sport or an instrument, uh, regular practice is critical. Um, I know that when I started learning how to play guitar when I was in high school, um, you get calluses on your fingers because they dig into the strings. And man, does it hurt in the beginning. Like You don't want to play. Your fingers are raw and they hurt. But the only way to overcome that is to keep playing. And then, if you play on even a semi-regular basis, you keep the calluses on your fingers. So then you pick up the tar and you're good to go. So same way with prayer. Uh, you'll get that callus on your soul. Is that? I don't know. I'll have to think about that one. I don't know how that works. But you build up where uh, you build up enough strength in your mind that when you sit down to pray, you can think like, man, this isn't going to be good prayer. Well, you learn, no, I'm going to dismiss that thought. God is here. God is with me. 
I'm not going to pay attention to that doubt. Because you know, hey, I've been praying. God has called me to pray. He is here with me. I am not knocking on a door. I'm not calling some disconnected number. I'm picking up a phone. God is already on that line. This is homework should you want to try it. This is how you extemporaneously pray, right? So like I just did in the beginning, or like I do with sports teams at NCC, or as I do at meetings, Father, can you pray? Yep, let's go. Three things, describe D, T, and A. Describe God, thank God, ask God. For example, you know, God, you are one in three. Uh, it is because of you that we are here today. We can thank God. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you uh, for this beautiful day that you've given us outside. Thank you for the people in this group. Ask. Lord, we need something. Lord, as we leave here, please help us to remember the gifts that we got during this retreat or seal in us those gifts. Keep our families safe. Keep us safe until we meet again. Please grant all this to Christ our Lord. Amen. So again, this takes practice too, where you can do it on a dime, but I just want to give you the confidence to do so because I know lifelong Catholics and they are terrified to do this. Like, oh, but what if it sounds better or what if it's not good? Prayer is prayer. You're, you're better than the person who has never done it, even if you do it for the first time. So give it a try. Um, I practice sometimes. Let's say I'm going to pray before a big NCC football game. I might think about, what do I want to pray for? Like, What specifically, what gifts do I want God to give them? So give it a try in the car or in the shower or before you go to bed. Describe God. You can thank God. You can ask God. All right, that is all I have. What questions do you have about prayer? Or what it looks like? Or if you have questions on how it works for a priest or anything like that? What do you want to know? When you have your um, prayers, where do you find the, the morning prayers? Are, are they in like um, the liturgy of the hours? Okay. Yeah. Two, two places. Oh, okay. Um, one is there's a four volume set where it has all the prayers in it and they follow the liturgical day. So the ones for Sunday are focused on Sunday. So again, there's five hours. It's like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're on the row. And then when Christmas comes around, we use a different volume and they're Advent themed or Christmas themed. So they follow the liturgical day. So if there's a saint of that day, those prayers, um, those prayers correspond with that. There's an app for it. It's so it's beautiful. I breviary. Um, this app has readings for the day, different prayers, readings for Mass, but most importantly, the breviary. If I'm traveling or at my parents' house, I have no excuse not to pray. So I have it right here, and you just pull up an hour and you just scroll. So that's where you find them. A, a little uh, help, some of, and um, we'll be talking about these later, but some of the little prayer helps also have like a modified now morning prayer for each day with the same format, but it's not as developed as, <coughs> as the Liturgy of the Hours, what Father's described. And then it'll also have a evening prayer for that day, and then it also has a night prayer. So some of the help. Yeah. And it has in the front is Zachariah, <coughs> is the um, canticle. Yeah, the, and the back Zachariah, is the canticle of Zachariah, mm -hmm. and, and then the Magnificat in the back. So it's, an, it's a a uh, modified version of the Liturgy of the Hours for uh, <coughs> lay men and women. Um, it, it's not quite as, it's, but it's based on the Psalms. They don't have as many Psalms. So we have three Psalms usually for morning prayer or evening prayer, but there's a Psalm. But I was thinking when he says, well, every morning I just go over to the chapel for my holy hour. Well, you know, if you have children at home mm -hmm. and you have a job you have to get to or whatever, you may not have a whole hour. You can just come up and go to the chapel. So that's why there's like a shorter version for people who, you know, don't have that because they haven't made those vows that where they've given their whole life to their order mm -hmm. and their and the church and they, that's mm -hmm. built into their vocation. Mm -hmm. Whereas our vocations as, you know, married people, parents, single, whatever, we might not have that time built mm -hmm. in. So we have, we, but we can still participate. Uh, you know. But if you do have that time, mm -hmm. depending on what stage of life mm -hmm. you're in, you could do the whole thing using the ivory 
It was also really important. My father said oh, everything was really important. It was good. <laughs> uh, but about the liturgy of the hours, it's, he father said it's the prayer of the church, meaning that when we pray that, it's not my own personal prayer, but Father, I, you, um, the monks in Gethsemane, all are praying those hours. And it's the church's prayer. So we're, we're joining our voices together, which is also really powerful. Uh, so I might not be feeling really great, you know, about where I am with prayer. I'm counting on Father to be right on top of it. Or we've got the other nuns or the priests, or we've got the, the uh, at Gethsemane, they say the hours together. Uh, and, but it's the same prayer around the world which I think is very important to know. Note that um, it's an organized prayer, but they call it the hours of the church. So it's all of us, and even in a modified version, we're, we're joining our voices with the people around the world. I think that's a really important piece. I read that someplace recently, because I always wondered, like, you know, it, it can feel like kind of, monotonous or whatever, because I've, I've read, done some of them before. I'm like, oh, you're just sitting there reading these songs. You know what I mean? But then I read something that someone said about that, that it, it's not about me. No. It, it, it's not necessarily for me. I, I might get something out of it, but it's the same with the Mass, really. It's not about me. It's about giving praise to God. It's about joining myself with the other people in the church and being one and connecting to God in that way. Mm -hmm. And yes, I might get something out of it, or it might just be, this is what I give to God. This is my gift to God, is to give, devote this little block of time to him during the day. And, and grow closer and in relationship. Like you just said, and what Father said, it's part of the, the liturgy. We use the word liturgy, so that's the liturgy of the hours, and that's the liturgy of the Eucharist, the Mass. It's, it's an official prayer of the whole church. So the Mass, uh, if we go to... Um, Korea, or if I went to Indonesia, or if I was in uh, Covington, much of the liturgy of the, of the is very similar because it's the prayer of the church. I think that's really helpful for me to know that we're we're part of the bigger picture mm -hmm. when we do those liturgical um, functions. Something that I struggle with with my prayer lately, and I'm not sharing this to feel like you guys have to solve this. But it's um, more like it's so habitual for me that sometimes I stop and think, do you realize that you're actually talking to God? <laughs> you know, an ambulance goes by. God could be with a paramedic. God could be with a situation and all that. And, and am I just saying this because it's a habit in my head? You know, or is this like a bona fide prayer? So for me, I'm kind of reevaluating my prayer and like, you are talking to God. <laughs> you know, like that's it. Like, it's powerful. Do you know who you're, do you, like? Do I know who I'm talking to? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think. Well, that, I think it goes back to the distraction thing, where you can, you can even be praying out loud, and you just realize, like, oh, I, it's kind of like when you're reading a book, and you're like, what was? I have to go back and read that page, right? Because you, you get in that in that routine. It even happens to priests during mass. You know, my mind will wander a little bit, like, oh, what's going on in the back of church, or, or what's after this, and I'll stop myself, without stopping speaking, but I'll refocus, and again. Do so with charity. We're human. We're we are body and soul, and the body gets distracted by things. It just come back, like Lord, I'm back. So even even priests d doing the most important thing I would do all day is say mass. You know, priests will even say like, I read all the words, I didn't really feel it, or, or wasn't focused. So we get distracted just like just like you do during mass, or maybe something is happening in their own lives, or someone passed away, so you're not as focused. Um, but to come back and to be gentle, you know, Lord. You know, I'm a priest. I'm not better than better than anybody else. I get distracted like everybody else. But like, thank you for calling me back. And so I just refocus. Because mm -hmm. the temptation can be is you know, oh, I should be better than this, or like, you know, I, I'm I'm this I'm this old. I've done this much. I should be able to focus on prayer. But the way we can approach it is be like children, right? That's the reason Christ he exalts children in the Gospels all the time. Because why? Like, they know they're loved. They make a mistake. They know they're forgiven. Um, and that innocence too. And also the humility is, they understand sometimes, you know, oh, I can't tie my shoe yet. I'll have my parent do it. But it's a humility, even as old as we are, acknowledging that, like, 
I can still be bad at things, but that's where God comes in because he's a father and he wants to help us. Because it's interesting, uh, Bishop Ithert, he had mass at Carmel Manor for the first time about, about a month ago. And his homily, uh, he's, uh, now this is a nursing home. And so he had these people who are at the end of their lives. And uh, he said, you now, he's talking about the communion of saints. He said, you now have the opportunity. Remember when you were a young mom and you had all those kids and you were busy trying to get your business up and running and you couldn't pray like you wanted to, but you can now. And so he was telling these hmm. elders that they now are filling in for the prayer of all of you, you know, in the business of your family, like dealing with the kids. Um, that's your prayer. But there will come a time when that prayer is uh, turned over. But I think you said it well, Father, when you said um, we pray always. And part of that, wake, like you said, waking up in the morning and making the morning offering. And what you're doing is saying, okay, driving the kids to school is part of my prayer. But I offered it in the beginning, and I turned it over to God. Um, I think that helps a lot, too, knowing that everything, as you said, is part of prayer. Yeah. Or if I know this traffic, like, Lord, I'm going to offer up my frustration for, I don't know, maybe there's an NCC student I know who's struggling. I'm going to offer it up for them. So even the most mundane things, it's like when you get in your car, Lord, I'm going to offer this drive up to you. Um, and you kind of remember in whose presence you are when you want to honk the horn or get angry that someone cut you off. Again, don't, do you know who you're talking to? God. So by making that a prayer, you know, I know, I know priests where they, you know, they say the guardian angel prayer when they get in their car. So they kind of know, okay, I'm with God. God is with me. Hopefully my, I will correct my behavior if I know I'm in God's presence. But yeah, you can offer up the most mundane things. I mean, to God, and that can be a prayer. Not just perfect set, up, set apart things. Like, Lord, I want to change my daughter's diaper. Like, this is for you. Like, God, you take care, you know, take care of my daughter. God, you take care of me. Thank you. He talked about being um, thankful even in the difficult things, you know. It's easy to say thanks for this good thing that happened, but I just heard this story the other day on the radio about a girl. She was like 12 years old, and very suddenly... Um, something happened to her and they took her to the hospital and found out she had this massive tumor in her brain. And the doctors were like, it's one of two things. It's either a very slow growing benign tumor and it just now got big enough to where it's suddenly causing these problems or it's cancerous and it grew really rapidly. And you know, if that's what it is, there's very little we can do for her because it's so big now and we aren't going to, you know. And so of course, the parents and many friends and family all began praying for her. They found out it was benign. They did surgery and removed it. The surgery went really successfully. Six months later, they go back and all these people are continuing to pray for her. They go back and for the follow-up visit and they cannot even find scar tissue from the surgery. It's like it was never there. Like it was, she was just completely free of everything. And at the dinner that night, the dad was telling the story, he said, my daughter, you know, at dinner we prayed at dinner, she said, oh, can I pray? And they, well, thank you, God, for this food we're about to eat, and thank you for giving me this tumor, and thank you for taking it away, hmm. and making me better. And so he finished praying, he said, okay, I have to ask, you know, you thanked God for taking away the tumor, that makes sense, why, why did you thank God for giving you the tumor? And she said, well, if me having that tumor helped even one person like have faith in God because they saw how the prayer was effective and help you know helped me, then that was worth everything I went through. You know, and for a twelve year old to have that presence of mind to be thankful for something, you know, that good God could bring good out of something bad that happened to her, it just made it like really humbled me to think, oh, how many times have I not been thankful or, you know, kind of been mad at God when something bad happened. Here's this 12-year-old who could recognize the good that came out of something bad that happened to her. So I thought that was a good, really great example of that, being thankful even in the suffering, even in a difficult situation. What do you think about praying for past events? If God is timeless and our timeline is linear and he's looking at the whole thing, what do you think about praying, praying for past events? This was a <coughs> Walking with purpose. What are your thoughts? 
That's a really good question. I think, I think St. Padre Pio said, we entrust the past to God's mercy, the present to his grace, and the future to his providence. So we entrust the past to his mercy. That what's, what has happened is done. We cannot rewrite it. Um, I think to pray for the past, we could maybe pray, God, help me to see where you were in this time. Because that's also a thing, too, as you grow in your relationship with God, and you can see how his help, his grace works, you're able to go back and see, oh my gosh, God was in that. You know, God was in that tumor. It takes, but it takes some growth and maturity. But you can look back with a new, a new lens and see the rest of the, your past life and say, wow, God, you were there in that time when I was running rampant and doing what I wanted and getting into all sorts of trouble. Like, God, now I've learned like you were there. So I think that probably a good way to approach it is, Lord, help me to understand what happened or help me to grow from that or help me to bear the fruit. Or if it was a really horrendous and bad thing, Lord, help me to heal from that. Um, I feel like that gets into the time travel. I know, it yeah. does, but if, if God is beyond time. He is. I, I have heard that you can mm-hmm. pray for like someone you know has passed away. Like me, like my dad passed away six years ago. And I we still I still pray for him. But he may have been in heaven for a while now. Yeah. I just don't know when that, you know, happened, right? Mm-hmm. But that God knew I was gonna pray today for him and would have applied that. Is that kind of what you're yes. thinking of? Mm-hmm. Applied my not. prayers today. Mm-hmm. To get him to heaven, because God's outside of time and He knows I'm going to pray for him now. Is that yes. kind of what you're thinking? That's yes. exactly yeah. But like we couldn't find any scripture to support that, and yeah. we were like, well, what are we just making this up? Um, I think but it's an interesting thought. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think of also if you ask your parent for something, you can't say, "Dad, could you have given me ten dollars <laughs> last week?" <laughs> like it doesn't work that way. So so I think we can look at the past. Right. We look at the, but we pray for the present and into the future. Like like. You know, Lord, you know, I, I regret I didn't recognize this person suffering in my life. Help me to recognize those who are suffering now. Or help me to have eyes for those who are suffering in the future. So I think it can turn any regret from the past. Like, Lord, help me, if that happens again, help me in the future for that. Um, yeah, that and then I did like Vicky's answer where it's like, well, yeah, God knew you were going to pray. How do you, how do you, know, how do you know he didn't already ap- apply those? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Lori's quotes come up with some really cool scenarios. Wayne's <laughs> <laughs> got good questions. Like, it's always like outside of the box. I love it. That's why I asked her to be a sponsor because she has such good questions when she went through the RCI. <laughs> I was like, get her back in there because she'll be yeah. outside and she'll get those good questions and everybody else learns from it. <laughs> it's also a good example of what Father said as you start praying. So you've been through RCIA a while and some of these things, and now we have him with, with going with them, with walking with women with good purpose. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what you were saying, Father. It's like, we just <coughs> start, and it's just <coughs> trying, it, it, keep trying, but what you're doing is trying to work on the relationship. When you said at the very beginning, it's a relationship. And I think that's the important thing to remember. We're continually getting into this relationship uh, and it goes deeper and deeper as we as we pray. Right. But, like, uh, I think I feel like I can tell God to time travel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're that tight. <laughs> you did such a good job of doing an overview of oh. everything. I mean, because I kept thinking there's so many things huh. that come up, and we need. But the, it, you did a, a really nice job pulling that all together. I really like this whole thing with spontaneous prayer because I don't know how many men and women, good Catholics, don't think they can pray. They always look to father or sister mm-hmm. and basically all of us, and I thought that was so helpful Yeah. because all of us can spontaneously be yeah. prayers. Or if you ask someone in a, in a group of Catholics, like, can you do the closing prayer? 
or an opening prayer, it is automatically like doing our Father, and there's nothing wrong with that. But they don't know how to. Do oh, it. you can. I feel like that's like that's that. that's cheating. Like I use it all the time, and you just get good enough at making it sound good, or if you do it enough, you have your own kind of motives motifs you use. Like one of mine is you know. Good and gracious God, you say where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with them. It's like, what a great way to start a meeting. Yeah. And so that kind of also quote scripture. That's always great in there. If you want to get flashy and quote scripture <laughs> or, or quote a part of the mass. Um, but yeah, it just it makes it really simple to, to pray in that way. Um, and like I said, when I pray for specific groups, it's really nice to bring in what they're going to do. Like for, and again, because I was a sports chaplain in seminary too. So what I pray before sports is, you know, I'll use... Old Testament imagery, like, Lord, you strengthen the Israelites when they went out to battle. And, um, cause like, I don't know, for the football guys, they're into that. Like, they're kneeling their, their arm in arm. It's like, Father, you're up. Like, all right, let's go. And so, I don't know. It's, it's so freeing to, to, yeah, to this just. This is the first time I've ever heard anything like this. I thought this was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then. It feels like I'm cheating. Like, I need to memorize some, like, very pious prayer or whatever. Like, no, just. Yeah, I'm, who, I'm always. We Do it. ask you to send your Holy Spirit. We thank you for that gift. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on what we're doing here today to guide us in this meeting or whatever. You know, that's I like going to Scripture. I like I know there it is in in, mm-hmm. in John in that Last Supper discourse. He keeps saying, I'm "Gonna send this this Advocate, this Holy Spirit, and you're not gonna be alone." So I'm like, "Okay, you promised that." <laughs> Get out of my car. I know, like running into school. <laughs> like, the Lord be with you. Like, get out. Hurry up, the magic door shut. <laughs> seminarian um, there was a different way of praying and then and then when you actually were a deacon uh, so our life experiences are really critical to our relationship and they do flavor it's like the salt and pepper of prayer it's it's not just we just dropped in it's like when you first got to meet your the love of your life you know <laughs> and then as you get on into into your married life uh, your relationship changes and that's the same thing with prayer. So um, for I know a couple people, Linda aren't, Linda's always wanted to talk about when she first became a Catholic, and uh, she was just over, you know, the new, the, the excitement of this new life, you know, and she was really, and you know, that happens, that'll happen, I'm presuming, you know, for, at the Easter vigil. But then like you kept saying, Father, to set a routine because the honeymoon won't last forever. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, but that's where, in our relationship with God, it, we get into a more mature experience of, of prayer as you do with your relationships. But uh, you, you hit it right on. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> I have lots of practice in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to be the timekeeper here and say it's 2.15. So we have like a little five-minute break because somebody needs to use the restroom and then we'll come back and sit. Shauna will uh, take us into Lectio Divina and teach us a little bit about praying the rosary. Right. So let's take a little break. Father did the introduction. Coordinate.